Good morning, this is Mark Johnson here at the Natick Massachusetts Morris Institute Library. It's July 12th, 1999. This is a, an interview conducted in the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project and we're here with Howard Balcom. And for the record, could you state your name? Yes, my name is Howard Balcom. And how old are you? I'm 79 years old. Where do you live? Sister Street, Natick, Massachusetts. Okay. And your current marital status? I'm married uh, to former Gene Sutherland and with, it's almost 56 years. Well, congratulations. And any children that you've had? We have a daughter and a son. A son lives in Arlington and our daughter lives in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, good. And grandchildren? We have a, one granddaughter, Julia. Good, good. And where were you born? I was born in Natick, January, January 15, 1920. And you were, lived your whole life in Natick? All except the years I spent in the service. Good. What changes have you seen in, in Natick over the years? Well, excessive growth for one, one of the problems. Uh, I think uh, it was a very quiet town until after the service and uh, the growth, particularly in the last 10 years, have, has been uh, almost too much for a little town. Yeah. What's your family background? Are they from Natick originally? Or? Yes, my, uh, my father was born in Natick and uh, my grandfather built a house on Felt's Court in Natick, so I guess we've been Natick as long as I can remember. You've got deep roots, huh? And what did your, did your father do? My father worked for Grease Fledger Tanning, which was in the building that is now occupied by Whipple, the Whipple Company. Okay. And what about any brothers and sisters that you had while growing up? I have uh, three brothers and two sisters. All my brothers served in the services. My oldest brother served with uh, Patton in Germany. Uh, brother younger than myself uh, was a medic, medic uh, corpsman. He served in Europe, and my youngest brother, he was, he was in the service for a while, and uh, I don't think he ever left the States. Yeah. What was like, life like growing up here in Natick, if you could just well, give a feel for it? I really, it, it, uh, all my younger years seemed, seemed to be fun, a lot of fun. We had a lot of open space. Uh, there were a few large farms so that uh, there were places to go and visit and I don't know, it, it just seemed uh, that there was more available to do. We didn't have structured play times, we didn't have uh, the hockey programs, we didn't have the baseball programs for kids. We got a gang together and we made our own fun. Yeah. So. When did you notice the most change in it? Was it after your years in the in the military? After, after the war, things uh, changed. You needed additional housing. Everything seemed to grow. Uh, I, Martin Serrell came to town, and the town grew overnight, almost. When and where did you enter the military? I entered the uh, military in Boston, October 8, 1941. And what prompted you to enter the military? Well, what prompted me was I had talked with the draft board and uh, it looked as though I was going to be in their next selection. So I decided that uh, much, much against my parents' wishes, that uh, I would go to Boston and see if there was a possibility of my getting in the Air Force because I certainly didn't want to get into the ground troops. So anyway, I went to Boston and everything went well. I was accepted in the Air Force and uh, I came home and told my parents and they said, oh, you're crazy. You, you didn't do anything like that. I said, I did. And I'm leaving in about four days. Oh my. So. That was it. 
Uh, I reported the four days later, and uh, there were eight of us that were put on a train, and we headed for Jefferson Barracks, just south of St. Louis, Missouri. So quite and a change from a quite a change. Yeah. How old and were you at this time? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. And uh, I was I was so amazed in my life to see the rows of tents that we were going to live <laughs> live in. Uh, we had small pot-bellied stoves that uh, used soft coal for heat. It was, it was cool. They had cool nights, so it was interesting. A couple of fellows were assigned every night to keep the little pot-bellied stove going, and uh, that was the beginning of basics. So. Yeah. What was the feel throughout the country? Because this is still a few months before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, I guess the the feeling was that something was going to happen, and we were trying to get ready as soon as we could. Uh, that was the way I felt, and most of us uh, at Jefferson Barracks uh, felt the same way. Where everybody was eager to learn all they could and, and really get trained for whatever the outcome. And well, it was, I'll tell you, uh, I was never so impressed in my life was at Jefferson Barracks, we had our first formal retreat. And I, I never, as long as I was in the service, I never saw a larger crowd of soldiers for, for a retreat ceremony. Of course, uh, a lot of us didn't know our left from our right, but uh, we managed to march out and have the ceremony. Yeah. What was basic training like for you? Well, basic training was a lot of, in a lot of instruction. The poorest part of basic training was getting all your immunization shots. Uh, you know, when the when the fellow ahead of you keeled over the minute they stuck the needle in, you wonder what was going to happen to you. But it uh, it was it was all part of uh, a great experience, really. Everything, everything. Another day. Every day brought something new, which was it, it made made life more interesting. Did you uh, develop any close friendships during this time in BASIC? In BASIC, no, because uh, there, were, there were a few fellows you got close to, but we knew uh, after BASIC training we would go separate ways because they, they, were, they, were, they were not all Air Force people. It was uh, a station where you had your BASIC training and then you would go to your uh, designated assignment. Did you have any idea what that would be at the time? I knew, I knew I was going to aircraft mechanics school, but where the, uh, at that time there were two. There was one in Texas and one in Biloxi, Mississippi. And after basic training I was sent to Biloxi, Mississippi. Why were you specifically tracked into the aircraft mechanics school? Well, the uh, attitude, the aptitude tests, and the testing program that they gave you, uh, more or less, pointed to the direction that uh, you thought they thought you should follow. Uh, it was just a, you know, a battery of tests and aptitude, to mechanical ability, and. And, and, then, and then they knew what was best for you, so that's where you went. And were you excited about being in aircraft mechanics? Oh yes, I, I was. Uh, I had been in, interested in aviation ever since, uh, I guess, before junior high school. And uh, having an airport in my backyard practically made all the difference in the world. I spent many hours at the local airport, and a couple of summers I worked there. So it was just, as a matter of fact, uh, 
we had a model airplane club in junior high school, which uh, I became quite involved in. As a matter of fact, I still have my models today. I have radio control planes that I play with. So, so that, that fit into your interests well then? Yes. Yeah. It, it's a wonderful hobby. Wonderful hobby. Yeah. Now, moving from Natick to St. Louis and then to Biloxi, Mississippi, what was the change in weather and did that affect you? Well, I don't know uh, whether it affected us or not. Uh, it, it just seemed that, you know, it was another part of the, a great adventure. Uh, we got to Biloxi and the base was not totally completed. They were building as fast as they could. We had muddy streets. Uh, the mess hall, they fed us, but uh, there were still things lacking in the kitchen that were supposed to have shipped and hadn't shipped. But uh, we made out. So were you sent from St. Louis to Biloxi as part of a unit, as part of a group? Yeah, there were, there were about 12 of us that went from uh, Jefferson Barracks to Biloxi. Okay. And what, what was the date that you did transfer? Oh, the, the date? Approximately. I think it was uh, probably the first week in December, the last week in November, first week in December. So immediately before the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yeah, it was before. Okay. It, was, it was probably the middle of November. And uh, we were just getting, we had just been assigned to uh, barracks and just get, getting oriented to finding our way around the base. And then December 7th came and everybody went hoopy a little and uh, they ran around and issued, you, you would have thought the Japanese were in the Gulf of Mexico. They ran around and gave us gas masks and rifles with just covered with cosmoline. What was that? It was a heavy grease to keep, they were right out of storage. So our first, uh, our first lesson the following day was how do you clean the rifle? So it was, it's, uh, and it's hard to remember all the things, but we, I know we were running around like crazy. We had a staff sergeant in charge of our barracks who was like a house mother, but uh, it was, just another part of the story, I guess. So what was the general feeling uh, among the soldiers after, after Pearl Harbor? Well, everybody was ready. It seemed the, the patriotism was everywhere. No, it, it just, uh, everybody was there for a purpose and wanting to do whatever they could do to get things straightened out. Had you been following the, uh, the war in the Pacific or the war in Europe before that time? Well, somewhat, but uh, still being so far removed from it, there wasn't the sense that you were at war. I mean, you relied on the news media and you just, uh, it seemed, it just seemed it was too far away to be involved. So then, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, you're still at Biloxi. What happens then? Does your tra training um, speed up, or how long do you stay there before you're, you're transferred out of Biloxi? Well, uh, we started, we started uh, aircraft mechanic school, which was very structured. Uh, you, you got through uh, the engine course and, and uh, troubleshooting, and we uh, did uh, some metal, metal work, metal repair, uh, fabric covering, 
of uh, control surfaces. Uh, I think we were there about 22 weeks. I don't remember exactly. Uh, but uh, we had, we had uh, classes. We also had uh, close order drill marching and it was all a very structured course that uh, we had, we had, uh, oh golly, we went to the sh rifle range and it was all part of the training program. What type of aircraft were you training to, to work on? Was it anything specific or just in general? It's pretty much uh, general. Uh, it was pretty much general. Uh, the Allison engines, which were popular at the time, and uh, both radial and inline engines we worked on. And we learned how to uh, repair the uh, brakes and just pretty much general repair. So after this, this 22 weeks at Biloxi, what was your next duty station? Well, the next duty station, uh, I was sent to uh, Hickam Field in Hawaii. There was uh, quite a group that went to Hawaii. We, uh, we got on a troop train at uh, Biloxi and headed north. It took us five days to get from Biloxi to San Francisco. We went it seemed like on every single track, back road, rail system they had across the United States. So that uh, apparently they didn't want us to know where we were going because it seemed as though we changed direction just about every 12 hours. But we finally, uh, we finally got to San Francisco. And I must say, one of the most beautiful sights that I've ever seen was we left Denver, Colorado in the morning. We had had breakfast in Denver and climbing the uh, Rockies, heading west and looking back to see Denver, Colorado, way down in the valley just before we went through the one of the longest tunnels in the Rockies. Uh, with the sun coming up, it was it was a gorgeous sight. So, as as a twenty one year old soldier, you're seeing basically all of the country. You moved from Natick to St. Louis to Biloxi. Now you're going cross country to San Francisco. Had you ever been out of Natick before no, this? No, I'd been out of Natick, but uh, I guess probably the furthest I'd been was uh, I had a cousin that lived in New York, and that's as, that's as far west that I had gotten. And when you were on this, this trek, this five-day trek to San Francisco, did you know where you were eventually going to end up? We had a, we weren't told until we got to uh, San Francisco, but we had a pretty good idea of where we were going because uh, we knew where they needed replacements. So when you get to San Francisco, then how did you get across to Hawaii? Well, we went on a, we went on a troop carrier and uh, everything was fine until we got just outside of the Golden Gate and got into the Pacific swells and even the uh, Filipino crew was sucking lemons so we, <laughs> we knew we were in for some problems and I guess we were probably an hour, an hour and a half beyond the Golden Gate and it was time for the for us fellows to line up and head for the mess hall. Well, as soon as most of them got inside the door and smelled the food, that was it. They all wished they had a lemon too. But uh, we, we survived. It took us, I don't know, I think almost six or seven days to go across the Pacific. We zigged and zagged all across the Pacific and finally got to Honolulu. Now why were you zigging and zagging? Because we weren't going fast enough 
to outrun the, any subs that might have been there. And we, we were in a convoy, so they changed direction frequently so that if they were following us, that uh, they'd be able to have the protection of, we had uh, destroyers and one cruiser, and uh, I think we had four destroyers protecting the, we had, uh, I think, six or seven troop ships. Were any submarines spotted on your way over? Not that, uh, not that we were aware of. They, they wouldn't tell us if we did see them, I guess. So when you arrived in Hawaii, what happened then? Well, we got to Honolulu, and uh, we were we unloaded from the uh, troop ship, and we were sent uh, on a small train up to uh, Wheeler Field, which is right right next to Schofield Barracks. Schofield Barracks was one of the uh, first targets that that the Japanese hit when they attacked Pearl Harbor. Did you see damage from the attack? It was evident everywhere. Wheeler Field uh, had, uh, they had fighter bombers there, the A-20, and that was an A-20 base, and they hit them first before they hit uh, Pearl Harbor. But uh, Wheeler Field was more or less a staging area. Most of the fellows were, were sent to Wheeler Field. We were there probably a week. And uh, we knew we were going to Hickam Field, but it was just another, another uh, staging area where they went through your records, made sure you had your immunization charts and that everything, all your records checked out. And, then we was, there were about uh, 15 of us sent down to uh, Wheeler, to Hickam Field from Wheeler. And where was Hickam located in relation to Pearl Harbor? Hickam was right next to Pearl Harbor. So it was one we of the could, aircraft? The main, channel, the main channel into Pearl Harbor paralleled a uh, couple of the runways at Hickam Field. What about any damage there? Oh, there, there was uh, damage in evidence there. Uh, a lot of it had been temporarily repaired, but uh, there was uh, there was still a lot of shrapnel damage from the bombs, and but they had uh, everything pretty well restored so that uh, it was operational. So did you immediately go to work then and begin your me aircraft mechanics? Well, we were assigned to uh, a section and uh, had a uh, master sergeant in charge of a uh, group, and I worked for uh, Sergeant Butterfield, who had two B-17s, and uh, two B-18s that we took care of. B-18 is a twin engine, one of the first bombers that uh, I went into the, uh, I was assigned to the fifth bomb group, uh, 394th Squadron, when uh, I arrived at Hickam. And uh, Master Sergeant Charles Ohama, he was the first sergeant. and. Uh, one of the uh, fellows that, I guess he became a little interested in me because he was, uh, he was a really a career soldier. He had, uh, as a matter of fact, he had about 27 years in when we got there and he was looking forward to retiring and heading back to the States. But the war came and he was there for the duration. But uh, awfully nice, nice man. Uh, but we got, uh, we learned how to, how they refuel and at a base. 
and uh, did some repair as a uh, aircraft mechanic and then I was uh, assigned to fly as a, an assistant flight engineer for, uh, oh I guess I had 10, 12 flights on the B-18s. We used to fly down to uh, Hilo, Hawaii and pick up fresh vegetables and fruit and fly it back up so they'd have it in the kitchen at uh, Hickam. But it gave, it gave the crews a little uh, extra fresh, fresh vegetables and fruit. A little break from the normal diet. Break. How was, how was the food when you were at Hickam and in the was, military in general? Very good, very good. No, uh, things worked out quite well, really. Did you uh, make any close friends when you were at Hickam? Yes, uh, I had uh, two or three close friends. One, uh, Harris Westerhoff, he was from Jackson, Michigan, and uh, a Les Bauer who was from Indiana. His father had a big hog farm. He was, well, those were a couple of guys that I got to know quite well. Did you stay in touch with them after your years in the military? I stayed in touch with them uh, until, oh, I guess probably six months after I got back to the States for pilot training and then just kind of lost track. So now you mentioned that you get back to the States. Uh, before we move back to the States and pilot training, how was your time in Hickam Field, at Hickam Field spent? Well, Hickam Field was, was uh, enjoyable. Uh, it was a lot of work, but uh, we enjoyed. We flew, we flew what they called Y searches. Uh, you'd go out 200 miles on a on a heading, and it looked just like a Y. You'd fly 50 miles across, and then you'd make a Y and head back to the base. But everybody, all the pilots loved to fly the B-18s because they would float if you had to ditch. They had flotation uh, compartments built into the wings. So if they had to ditch, it would float. It w as long as you didn't break it up, it would float like a boat. And so, the other aircraft didn't have flotation no, devices? No, no, the 17s that were also there, uh, they, they had no, no flotation built in. So did, was it, uh, did it happen that people did have to ditch when they were on these reconnaissance missions? Oh, well, one of the, one of the uh, reasons we flew uh, a couple of search missions, we, we were looking for a General Tinker, who was commanding general of the 7th Air Force. He was flying from uh, Hickam to Midway, and we thought, well, I guess they thought that uh, he had had to ditch. They had problems with the, uh, it was really, a, it was a forerunner of the B-24, LB, a Liberator, an LB-30 which was really uh, to carry personnel. It wasn't, it wasn't a bomber. It was prior to the development of the B-24, but it was the same, basically the same plane. That got lost somewhere on, en route to uh, Hickam, from Hickam to Midway. They don't know, they never, they never found the they found an oil slick, but uh, never anything from the plane. No survivors? No survivors. So during your time flying these missions, did you encounter any en enemy? No, no, we had no enemy contact whatsoever. So you were never in direct combat? No, not, you were not in. in uh, we flew uh, quite a few search missions looking for Eddie Rickenbacker when he was lost in the South Pacific. So then you, you mentioned uh, before the interview that then you transferred uh, back to the States before going to Europe. Could you tell well, us how through, that came about? Through uh, no, Charlie Hummer uh, mentioned 
he said, you know, Howard, he said, you should take the aviation cadet exam. And uh, I said, well, do you think I do all right? And uh, he said, well, I want you to talk to Captain Bird. And uh, he was a pilot I had, flew, had flown with a few times. And uh, Captain Bird said, he said, absolutely. He said, uh, I'll get the papers and uh, we'll see, we'll go from there. And that was it. He got the papers and Charles Hummer uh, forwarded him to 7th Air Force headquarters. And uh, gee, I guess it was probably 10 days later, I was no longer an enlisted man. I was an Air Force cadet. So then I was put on a waiting list to come back to the States. Heading, heading, I was heading for the Western Flying Training Command and going to be sent to Santa Ana, California. Now, had you always wanted to be a pilot, or how, how did this make you feel? Well, it made me, hey, I, at that point in time, I couldn't envision anything better for a young kid from Natick living next to an airport. Uh, having an opportunity to learn to fly was unheard of, really. No, it, it was beyond my greatest expectations. But uh, it was it was wonderful. So you were put on the waiting list, and then how long were you on? Oh, probably. Uh, I think it was about five days. The transportation came through and came back. We came back on. Uh, Oh, this was uh, quite a few. They had quite a few uh, wounded come back. It was on a on a ship, but it was fast enough so that it was a fast one, so that we came alone back to uh, San Francisco. And did you still zig and zag to avoid the subs? No, or was it a straight no, it's just straight shot. We came back in about, I think three three, four, four days. No problem at all. So how long had you been uh, stationed in Hawaii? Oh, let's see. What do you think? Gee, I don't know, about uh, eight months. Eight months? Eight, eight and a half months. So you get back to San Francisco, mm -hmm. and then uh, where were you sent next? I was sent to uh, Santa Ana, Santa California, and which was a pre-flight training, where they gave you uh, another, you went through a whole testing program again, and that included regular, regular classes of uh, physical training, uh, we had uh, math courses. Uh, we had close auto drill again, which is by we were back to basic as far as marching and uh, everything the military does. We had uh, we were back to uh, the rifle range again and pistol. The whole what they thought you needed to be a soldier. So, how long did that take? Well, I think we were there about uh, six weeks. And then on to. Then I went to a basic uh, primary flight training. Now, I must say that I was one of the fortunate ones. To, I don't know whether it was a result of the, our testing or what, but I went to a uh, civilian primary. School, Hancock College of Aeronautics, for my primary training. I went to another civilian school, Pol Polaris Flight Academy, for my basic training, which was, you know, they were top shelf schools. Where were these at? One was Santa Maria, the primary was Santa Maria, California, 
and the uh, basic was Lancaster, California, right on the edge of the Mojave Desert. And this is where you received your first flight training? My first flight training was primary, Santa, Santa Maria, California. That's where I soloed and really learned to fly. Then the basic training, you become involved in a little more powerful air, aircraft and uh, you learn, you first start your aerobatics and your instruments and have a little more power to have a little more fun. So, and then for advanced training, I went to Yuma, Arizona. And this is back into the military training then, or is this no, that's, still civilian? That's a mi military school. That was an yeah. Air Force base. And that went, uh, we went back to uh, all, strictly all Air Force, no, no uh, civilians. So is this the last step in a pilot's training process? Yes. The uh, advanced training is your final, final training uh, in the pilot program. And uh, we graduated, uh, our class was uh, 43K. And what type of aircraft did you train in, in Yuma? Oh, in uh, advanced training, we had the AT-6, the AT-17, and the AT-9. We, two, two of them were twin engine, and uh, the AT-6 was single engine. But we, came, we became proficient in all three. And then from, from advanced training, it was on to? We went to four engine training. Four engine transition school was uh, Roswell, New Mexico. And so this would be for the B-17 yes. training? Yes, yeah, our first, uh, our first, uh, our introduction to four engines. And I guess we spent about eight weeks there, eight, eight weeks. How long was this entire process from the, the first transfer back to the States until you eventually graduated? Well, almost, uh, about 15 months, 15, 16 months before. See, we went from uh, Roswell to uh, Sioux City, Iowa for operational training. That's where, uh, that's where my crew was assigned. And then we, got, we did all the operational training, getting ready to go overseas. As a matter of fact, when I got to Sioux City, one of the fellows that was there was Charles O'Hama. He showed up again. He was in, he was, uh, in the training program as, uh, well, he was still a first sergeant, and I, he could have dropped dead, and so could I when we got assigned to Sioux City. He didn't know I was coming, and I didn't know he was there. No. He was tickled to death to see that I had made it as far as I had. He was the man back in Hawaii who in Ho suggested. In Hawaii, right. Okay, good. So you were assigned to your crew there. Is this the crew that you were this then a, transferred to Europe? This with? is the crew that I trained with uh, at Sioux City, and we all went to Europe together. Did you become close with these men? Close, yeah, very close. As a matter of fact, it uh, was like one big family. And how many are on a crew? Well, we had uh, 10. Most of the time, once in a while I had, well most of the time I had 11 because uh, out of my 30 missions, I flew 22 lead and uh, nine deputy lead. And so what does that mean when you're on a mission and you're flying lead? Well, a group is made up of three 12-ship formations. And you have the lead squadron, you have the high squadron, and the low squadron is 12. And uh, you have your lead, your high, high, and then the low. So that that's the way the formation is made up. And uh, the lead, your lead position is 
number one in the lead squadron that flies in the it really flies in the middle. You have the high element which is stacked above the lead 12 and the low element which is stacked below the lead 12. That's so that if you have to turn they can slide. You've got room to okay. avoid everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. So now of these 12 crew members, uh, what were their individual assignments and what was your individual assignment? Well, my individual assignment was the pilot, left seat. I had a co-pilot, uh, Carol Hills from Jackson, Michigan. I had bombardier Paul Kelly from Chicago, Illinois. I had uh, navigated Norman Strand from uh, New York. I had a uh, radio operator who was Bob McKay from Cleveland, Ohio. I had uh, flight engineer Bob Waldron from uh, Fort Pierce, Florida. I had a navigator Walt Kwan from San Francisco. I had uh, tail gunner Harry Barber, who was the dad of the crew. He didn't have to be in the service, but he volunteered. Uh, he was the old man of our gang. He was a uh, Former, uh, well, he was an analytical engineer for DuPont and uh, a great guy. He was also our armorer. He took care of all the guns on the plane. They had Bob Searcy from Hermitage, Tennessee, and Bob Smith from uh, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And there are only three of us left. And have you stayed in, in contact with them? as long as I could. Still contact uh, Bob McKay and I contact Paul Kelly once in a while who was the bombardier. He's not too well. But the rest of them have all gone to heaven. So when you're assigned this crew then take us from Sioux City to your eventual station in, in England. <clears throat> well we uh, finished up at Sioux City and we were transferred to Kearney, Nebraska, where we picked up a brand new 17, spent three days, three or four days at Kearney, Nebraska, checking out a new 17, and uh, left for, we were on our way to uh, England. We flew from, from Kearney, Nebraska, well, we flew from Lincoln, Nebraska to Manchester, New Hampshire, Rennia. And one of the biggest thrills was buzzing Natick on the way to Manchester. I got, we, we came east, got as far as Worcester, and I knew my way down Route 9 and buzzed uh, Natick a few times and headed for Grenier in Manchester. So were you, was this a single aircraft that you were flying? Yeah, we were, were there no, we, were all, we were all alone. Okay. We were all by ourselves. As a matter of fact, we, we were all, uh, all alone, all the way to England. No, that was the thrill of a lifetime flying over Natick. So we stayed a uh, couple of days at Grenia. They checked everything out. And we went from Grenia to Goose Bay, Labrador. Labrador. And from Goose Bay, Labrador, we went to Reykjavik, Iceland. We were supposed to land and get some rest. And, but uh, in Iceland, the sun doesn't set in August. So they were playing baseball all night. And we left Reykjavik and headed for England and landed just out outside of Liverpool. Left our brand new plane and I was assigned with the crew to the 306 bomb group, which was uh, just outside of Bedford, England, the uh, town we were next to was uh, Thurley, a little small town. So and, that, and that's where uh, I was assigned to the uh, 
367th Bomb Squadron and began a European tour. So backtracking a little bit, before you left the States to Europe, did you get to see any of your family members or have any time off? No. No, I saw my, I saw my folks and my wife uh, while I was at Grenier, Manchester. That's all. Oh, uh, it was interesting stopping at uh, Manchester. Uh, I bumped into a fellow who came from Natick, uh, John Sandow. Yeah, Colonel John Sandow, he lived on North Main Street up in uh, North Natick, where I came from. And uh, he was in charge of the North Atlantic Wing Air Transport Command. And he came looking me up because he had seen uh, my crew listing and where I was from. And he said, well, if you want to stay a few more days, we can find something wrong with your plane and uh, give you a little break. But I said, no, I, I didn't feel I could do anything like that, so. But uh, he, was a, he was a pilot for American Airlines for many years. But he was also a National Guard pilot when I was a kid. And he would come out in an old Douglas observation plane and fly around NATO a few times. And that's, that's where he got a start. He's, he got a start as a army pilot, but... So you get to, you get to England, and what, what time of year is this, and what, what's the date, approximately? The, uh, the date is, well, it's probably the end of August. And what year? 44. The end of August, 44. So what was the situation with the war in the European theater at the time? Well, there was still uh, there was still a lot of fighting going on. It was uh, before the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, there was a lot of ground action, and uh, I guess the the Germans were feeling their losses and trying to make inroads into France and trying to fight back a little, I guess. So American troops had landed at Normandy in June mm -hmm. and they were trying to push in. Right. What was uh, your role in, in the fighting? Well, we flew, we flew a few missions uh, trying to uh, restrain the Germans, the German advance. Uh, right around, it was right around Christmas time. Uh, I can't, I know we flew three or four missions at that time. Just, uh, I'd have to look at the list, my listing of <laughs> missions. So, so how were these initial missions? This is your first time in combat? No, I flew, I flew my first two missions I flew as co-pilot. Okay. This is just to kind of an indoctrination, give you an idea of what, what you're going to be seeing and what to look forward to or not to look forward to, or whatever the case may be. But, uh, you know, the crew, the crew was split up too. We didn't fly, the first two missions we didn't fly as a crew. We were broken, we were broken up to, as an orientation bit, which was really worked out very well. Uh, and then on the third mission, we were, we were all together. And uh, no, I, I guess I was one of the fortunate ones. I brought my total crew home, which A lot of them didn't do. So how how was your first uh, your first missions? Tell tell us about your first experiences. Well, my 
I guess my first experience uh, all kind of went as I expected after after flying as a co-pilot. Uh, you knew what flak looked like and uh, you knew you had uh, good fighter protection. We had waves of 51s that uh, followed us in and followed us out. They didn't, 51s, we had no 51 support in the target areas because uh, what you had there, we had P-47s. Uh, a radial engine was uh, much better in the flak areas than uh, inline, liquid cooled, because all you had to do was get a puncture and your engine was gone. But the 47s, uh, they could lose a cylinder and keep going, so. We did, uh, we had uh, very good, very good support on all our missions. So other than the, the flak from the anti-aircraft guns on the ground, were there German fighters that would attack you? We had uh, twice on uh, later missions, we had encounters with the new German jet, which uh, fortunately, it was so fast, the gun sight didn't compensate for the speed. So they were in and gone before you realized it, particularly uh, if they were coming in from anywhere from nine to three o'clock. The rate of closure was so great that uh, they were gone before they could do much damage. So had you heard about this new German jet? Oh yes, we had heard, we had heard. We, we had uh, aircraft identification courses uh, constantly. Anytime anything new was evident, uh, everybody, we had, that was one thing that went on constantly. We had ground training all the time. We just didn't sit around in the barracks and there was always something. Uh, we had, uh, if they had to replace an engine on a plane, the engine had to be, you had to fly the plane and you slow time, what they called slow time the engine. You'd break the new engine in again before you could fly missions and stuff with it. And we had, uh, we had training, gunnery training missions constantly. We'd go out over the wa what they called the wash, which was north of Norwich, England. And we'd have air-to-air uh, -air gunnery, you'd have a ship that would tow a target, a sleeve target, and they'd fire at uh, the sleeve. No, there was, uh, it wasn't just sitting around waiting to go on the next mission. It was, you had, uh, you had flight safety, you had uh, survival information that uh, was transmitted all the time. Uh, no, you didn't. You didn't get uh, too many minutes to sit around and worry about what was what going to happen or going on. They kept you busy, huh? Kept you busy. How did you feel about the B-17? Could you tell us about that plane and, and what it was capable of? Well, the B-17 was was uh, it was beautiful, really. Once you trimmed it and set the controls, so uh, it would just fly. Uh, it was uh, it was really uh, it wasn't quite as fast as a B twenty four. That was the only thing wrong with it. B twenty four. Every once in a while, they'd pull up alongside if you were on a training mission or something, and they'd wave at you and just pull away. And uh, no, they that was. But they both carried. I guess the B twenty four would carry a little more weight, but. Uh, no, we, as far as the 17 was concerned, it was, it was a beautiful airplane. Beautiful. So you mentioned you had uh, gunnery training. What type of armament did the B-17 have to defend itself? We had, uh, we had a chin turret. We had twin 50s. We had uh, 
a single 50 on each side of the nose. We had uh, a top turret, which was operated by the uh, flight engineer, twin 50s. We had a ball turret, we had twin 50s. We had tail gun with twin 50s, and we had uh, single 50s on each side of the fuselage. And this would be to try and defend yourself against fighter attack? Right. It, that was fighter defense, really. How Was it effective? Yes, because what you're talking about, you're talking about 12, at least 12 ship squadron. So that you've got, a, you know, concentrated firepower from 12 aircraft, usually. You just have to be careful you don't shoot down your own. Yeah. Because that has, that did happen. So, so w on these missions, when would the, the danger start? How long would a mission be, and when would you start to encounter the enemy fighters or in any flak? Well, the, uh, the missions varied depending on the target chose, chosen. Uh, I think the longest mission I flew was 10 and a half hours. And they averaged out to probably somewhere around seven hours. In all, I think my combat hours were a little over 247 hours. But uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't encounter too much flak until after leaving your initial point, they could tell where the target was going to be. Uh, what they would do was, uh, they had what they called barrage flak. It would, they would set up a pattern above the target from the anti-aircraft guns. And they usually fired four shells. And they were, they were time fuses. They would go off based on time. Uh, and then they would have tracking, the guns that would track the formation. And those were the, the ones that usually ended up getting you. The, the, um, the barrage flak, you got so you could read that. You'd see four, and if you turn to the, the, the ones that had just exploded, you couldn't, you couldn't change too much because once you left your initial point and headed for the target. The plane was on automatic pilot. It was locked into the bomb site. And you could, you could maneuver just a little with the automatic pilot. You couldn't change the course so that would, you would affect the bomb pattern on the ground. So, you had a little control, but you usually turn into the dead flak because you just hoped that the next four wouldn't come up in the same place. <laughs> It'd be a little, and that's what happened. They would sweep, you know, above the target. So it was the uh, the tracking that, and it, we bombed through uh, we bombed through cloud cover. Most of the lead ships were what they called Pathfinder. They had radar so you, you could bomb through cloud cover. You could see your target on the ground. All our lead, all our lead ships had that. So uh, what were your targets mostly? Did you know and, and what type of things would you be bombing? Well, one of the, uh, one of the main target areas were the uh, railroad marshalling yards that uh, that affected their transportation of anti-aircraft. Germany had uh, a lot of mobile anti-aircraft guns that they could move and they moved them mostly by rail. And uh, of course near the end of the war one of the major targets was the, their synthetic oil plants. One of the probably most heavily defended target I ever went to was uh, Merseburg. I went there twice, and that was their last uh, synthetic oil plant. 
So take us through a mission. How would things go from, from the time you're, you receive the orders until you actually embark on the mission and then the return flight? Well, uh, you knew, like, uh, the day before, if you were going to be scheduled for a meeting, if th there was a mission going to be called the next day, you knew you were going. So what would happen uh, around 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30, someone would go through the barracks and give you a tap and say, we're going. And uh, so you'd go have your breakfast, and then they'd say for briefing at 6.30, so you knew you might lay in the sack another 15 minutes, and as long as you figure out your time, you know, you could get the briefing at 6.30, and everybody in the briefing hall would uh, listen to, and usually uh, intelligence officer would be up the front with the, the map and say our mission is going to be such and such and uh, they tell you what your bomb load is and the uh, approximate time of the, you know, you'll be at the target and all that. You get a regular, I have a printed, printed slip or sheet that explains the whole uh, mission bit, and it tells you uh, what time you do. You, you should be at your plane. You start engines at a certain time. Your takeoff is at a certain time. You uh, have a marker beacon that you form on. Everybody takes off individually within about uh, 15 to 20 seconds of each other. You're all lined up on the taxiway lined up for the, uh, on the uh, major runway that you're going to use. And you will take off individually and uh, you head for your marker beacon. When you get to your marker beacon, you start circling. And uh, you're, uh, you're supposed to fly a certain airspeed and climb at a certain rate, so many hundred feet per minute. That way, you maintain the uh, proper separation between each plane, hopefully. Every once in a while, you run through somebody's prop wash and wonder where he is, you know, the, the uh, disturbed air. They hope he isn't right in front of you, that's all. But uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have any problems that way. Most everybody did what they were supposed to do. And you'd form up probably in your 12 ship formations uh, between 10 and 12,000 feet. And you always started your oxygen, put on your oxygen mask, 8 and 9,000 feet. So that make sure everything was going to work and you'd be on oxygen. Well, anyway, we'd, we'd form on, everything had a set time. You'd form on your marker beacon, get your 12 ships in formation, then you find your position in your 36 ship group and you'd head off. They would had the time that you left the coast of England and the departure point. You had very specific departure points and return points where you could cross the coast. Or if you crossed in the wrong place, fighters were on your wingtip in minutes. It was, it was uh, the protection was amazing really. So then you'd, uh, it would tell you you'd leave the coast at, say, 15,000, 20,000. And you'd enter, you'd cross the uh, European coast at another specified altitude. And uh, then you'd they'd say you would bomb at 25,000 or 26,000. Then you'd, you know by the time you got to your IP, you should be at your 26,000. And the IP is? Initial point. That's where your bomb bay doors open and you, you lock it into the uh, bomb site. Your uh, automatic pilot is locked into the bomb site. And as soon as, as soon as your bombs are dropped, 
you uh, turn off the automatic pilot, and then you uh, and you usually get out of the target area as quickly as you can. And then you're on your way home. And then you're on your way home. Huh? So these were daylight bombing raids. All all daylight. <clears throat> the British went at night. They had their 30 caliber guns and no, really no protection. So they used the cover of night as, as their protection. Right. So there weren't any raids with the British and the Americans bombing Germany. No, not. It was. They they did most of their uh, all their practically all their bombing at night. How did you feel about the, the, your allies, the British? I don't know if there was much feeling. They seemed like, the few that we met, seemed like pretty regular guys like most of us, really. They were there to do a job and so were we. No, I did land at uh, British base when I got the purple hat and they were very good to me. Tell so, us about about you receiving well, the I got, uh, I got hit in the foot. I got my fourth and the fifth metatarsal broken and flak went through my boot. And uh, it wasn't my foot they were worried about. My, my leg, when the piece of flak went through and stuck into the, hit the armor plate on the side, I have the piece in my purple hat thing. They were worried about, what they were worried about was where my knee came up and hit the wheel. It pushed my leg up and I had a lump above my knee about half as big as a grapefruit. So, so I spent a few days in the hospital and decided, they decided I was going to live, so I went back and finished my missions. So. Now on a regular mission, could you expect to be hit by flak and have pieces like that go through the plane at, at various points, or would you return pretty much unscathed? No. Uh, if you look at some of the pictures I've got, it was not unscathing, believe me. No, uh, I guess one of my worst missions was, I don't know, I don't think I'll get involved. Okay. But uh, no, I'll tell you, it was not it was not easy, a lot of them. I lost a fellow on his last mission from Flack. And uh, no, I, no, he flew part way home with half his head frozen on the windshield. No, I, But we had a we had a sh shell go through the nose, and it didn't it didn't explode till it got above us. But the shell went right through the from the bottom right through the top. It was only it was no further than you're sitting from me in front of me. He was down in the, the navigator down in the nose, and. Uh, But that's as close as it got. So were, were you scared when you went on these missions? I mean, what was the general feeling? Well, if anybody told you they weren't scared, when you got in the target area, they were crazy. No, when you see those puffs of black smoke, you don't know whose name is written on them. So. It uh, wasn't much fun, but it was something that had to be done. So you felt like you were making a difference in the, in the effort to defeat Germany? Right. We felt we had a job to do when we were doing it. That's
I guess that's the feeling of all of us over there. We were there to do a job and hope what we were doing helped the effort. Yeah. How did you feel about the Germans as, as an enemy? Well, I don't know. As I had <coughs> an awful lot of feeling, uh, they had something they were trying to do, and I guess when you afterwards you hear, heard more about the atrocities and what had actually gone on, I guess a lot we we didn't know what was going on, but. Uh, they were, I, I felt that uh, it seems though they should have had the intelligence to see through this leader they had, but uh, I really... Were they capable enemies? Oh, they were very capable very capable. It's just that uh, they ran out of supplies. If their supply line had uh, been a lot better, I think uh, things would have turned out a lot differently. No, uh, if, uh, if they had stockpiled more oil, gasoline, it would have been a lot different. I think that's one of the reasons we won the war. Uh, they had no oil, they had no fuel. So how did you feel about their, their weapons, their airplanes, as opposed to ours? And were ours on par the, with theirs? Or? I think their ME-109 was probably one of the best planes in the, in the sky. No, they had... Uh, they had very good aircraft, very good. As a, as a matter of fact, if uh, they had, if they had developed their rocketry a little earlier, I think it would have been a different ball game too. We used to see the V2s. You could see the contrail from the V2s. And uh, you knew that we were far enough north so that we didn't have the problem of having them land near us. Every once in a while you'd hear we're buzz bomb too. But uh, we thought that we were far, far enough north of London so that uh, we didn't have a problem. So now the, the buzz bomb and the V2 were rockets launched by the Germans from Europe right, to right. England. Right, the buzz bomb was would go prr, prr, prr. and then when it stopped you wonder <laughs> where it was going to land. It's going to come down, huh? But you were far enough north where you didn't have right. to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Did you, were there, was there the possibility of Germans bombing your site in England or was it pretty much that you were in danger when you're over Europe? We didn't have a, we didn't have much of a problem with uh, being bombed where we were. Uh, see, we were late enough in the war so that uh, the Germans didn't have the, the fuel. They had to fly very selective missions. Uh, and they kept them mostly on the ground until uh, the last minute too. They didn't waste any time in the air. They couldn't afford to. So you felt that, that by bombing these synthetic oil factories, you're actually taking a toll on their ability to make war. Oh, absolutely. That's why they were almost number one on the list. Yeah. So you said you flew 30 missions. Is that average? Is that high? Um, well, that was, uh, when I was there, it was, uh, you flew, th there was a 35 requirement. You flew 35 missions and then you were rotated back to the States. If you flew lead, you flew 30. That's why I flew 30. 
So when uh, when did you complete your your tour in Europe, and what happened then? Well, I completed my tour in Europe. Uh, I think it was in April. And uh, well, I. On the last mission, you're able, you know, they don't uh, say too much for you. You can buzz the field and have, have a little fun, which I did. And uh, then after we, after we finished, uh, you just kind of, they ask you uh, a lot of questions. You go through briefing and uh, they fill out how you feel, you know, at, at the end of your tour, and that's what it is, the end of your tour. And uh, you get in line to come home, mostly. Uh, let's see. No, that, that was uh, about it. You, you get on the uh, list to be returned to the States and one of the things they do ask you if you want to fly one of the war wearies back to the States, you know, they use them in the training program. And I think uh, about one out of ten say they will. The rest would rather take the boat. <laughs> so be before we go back to your time uh, in the States, would you like to show us the, the patches that you have? Well, the patches. We can focus the camera on those. If Bridges, bring them down in front of you. Hmm? Just if we could put them here. Yeah, the patches. Uh, this is a aviation cadet patch. This was the uh, Eighth Air Force patch that you wear on your arm, and this is the squadron patch of Three uh, Sixty Seventh Bomb Group Squadron. We were known as the clay pigeons. And for those who don't know what a clay pigeon is, it's the round disc they use in skeet shooting that goes poof. Is that what you felt like when you're up in the air, a clay pigeon just up well, there for target practice? Well, a few times, yes, a few times. Well, okay, so uh, now take us back to your discharge, I guess. Oh, well, we came back. We came back uh, by boat. One of the interesting things that happened on the boat was in the uh, dining room on the uh, tables, they had jams from the Whipple Company in Natick, Massachusetts, which was. Uh, Rather, it really made me feel good to see something from Natick. Uh, we came back to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Came home. We just kind of uh, processed through for a leave and uh, came home for Gee, I don't know, maybe a week. And then we went down to uh, the boardwalk down in New Jersey, I guess it was. Atlantic City. We went down to Atlantic City for uh, rest and relaxation, Mama and me. And I got the worst sunburn I've ever had in my life. Uh, oh, it was great down there. They, had uh, you were debriefed, and it was just uh, just a vacation, I guess, after all the war fun. Was it a feeling of relief being finally safe and at home? Very relieved, yes, very. You know, uh, down there I took uh, the exam for uh, a permanent commission in the Air Force and uh, received that. I could have uh, 
a lot of us were, you know, for the, you were given a commission for the duration plus, and uh, you could take an examination and get a, what they call a AUS commission, which meant you could apply to stay in the regular Air Force, continue your service. But I thought about that for a while, and my wife thought I'd had enough flying, so we decided that we'd go on our own. We came back to Natick, and well, a while after I was back, I went to work for the telephone company, and. Things have been wonderful ever since. Good. Now, did you take advantage of any of the benefits afterwards, uh, the GI Bill or? Yes, I uh, went to school for a while with the GI Bill. And uh, the telephone company offered a very good program for on-the-job training. And uh, I decided it sounded pretty good and spent 36 years there. So it worked out very well. Now, after your time in the military, did you join any veterans organizations, or have you stayed active in, in the American Legion or anything like that? Oh, I did. Uh, I did belong to the VFW and the American Legion for a few years, but it, uh, not the VFW too, but I don't know, I did just too many other things yeah. to do. How did you feel you were treated when you came home? Oh, I felt uh, treated fine. I, I just felt like I'd been on vacation and had come back to town and, you know, a lot of my friends were back and swapped war stories and it was, uh, it was great. Great to come back to Natick. How do you feel uh, your service in the military affected the rest of your life? Well, I think the experience was was wonderful, really. Uh, there were times that were trying, but uh, I think it was all all a part of what was happening at the time. And uh, I felt good to be a part of it. It just made you think that, uh, well, after being in the war, uh, it was pretty darn nice to be back and have a job and have a family and know things were going to be all right. So. How do you feel about the difference in public opinion between uh, regarding veterans from World War II as opposed to Korea and Vietnam? Well, I think I think the feeling, the difference in feeling, was probably caused by the politicians and the news media. They they seem to that seems to be the biggest influence on a lot of people's lives is the news media and the way the politicians present uh, the facts on, you know, what's happening. That's the way I feel about it. I, I don't know whether. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what was your most memorable experience from your service? Oh dear, I had a few of them. One was flying over Natick in the B-17. And the other was, hey, when you can buzz the field after the, on the 30th mission, the completion of the 30th mission, it made you feel great to know that you'd made it. So. I'm sorry I didn't bring a 
the rest of the stuff. But no, we can we can maybe get that a little bit later. But in closing, is there one thought that you'd like to leave uh, anybody who who will watch this tape in the future, any family members or historians who'd be watching this tape? Well, I don't. I don't know. I've told them my story and. Uh, just keep patriotism alive. That's that would be my message. Well, we thank you very much for participating in our program, and we appreciate you sharing your your story with us and your service to our country. Well, I thank you very thank much you. for asking me. Institute Library. It's July nineteenth, nineteen ninety nine. It's a week after the interview that's on the first half of this tape, and we're here again with Howard Balcom. And we're privileged to have him bring in his collection of artifacts that he secured during the war. So, Howard, if you'd like to explain these to us. My mementos from, from World War II. Uh, first, I don't know whether you can see this or not. You can't? No. Can't see it. Okay. I did get the Caterpillar Club during my ventures in the service. Uh, I had a plane catch fire uh, over the Mojave Desert and had to uh, make an, emer an emergency exit and uh, float down in a parachute, which was uh, an unbelievable experience. Peace and quiet all the way down to the ground. When was that? That was in base when I was in basic training in uh, 1943. Can't tell you, tell, can't give you the month. Yeah. It was in 1943. And uh, for my efforts in Europe, uh, I received the Air Medal with four oak leaf clusters for uh, completing 30 missions over Germany. On one of my missions, I was wounded by a piece of flak. I don't know whether you can see that or not. Can you, Bob? You can see it, okay. So that's your Purple and, Heart? And this is the Purple Heart that I received for being wounded in action on uh, January 8, 1945. And explain to us what that piece this is. This is a right piece here. of a, an 88 anti-aircraft shell, uh, which it bursts in the air and breaks into fragments, and it's the flak uh, going through the air that causes the damage to uh, aircraft and personnel. So that was a near miss for that you? Was, that, that was, was the, one, they hit the one that they pulled out of the side of the armor plate, at the left-hand side of the cockpit, yeah. and gave it to me as a memento. That was a purple hat. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the Air Medal, which uh, I received for 30 missions over Germany, completing 30 missions. I have the medal with four oak leaf clusters. So what does the four oak leaf clusters mean? Well, usually, uh, you, the, for the first 10, you get the medal. Then for each five, they give you an oak leaf cluster. Okay. And where I flew 30 missions, uh, I ended up with the medal and four oak leaf clusters. And it all started, I don't know if you can see those, but I graduated uh, as a first pilot, uh, the class of 43K at Yuma Army Air Force Field, Yuma, Arizona. And those are what you, are what you receive when you graduate? Yes, yeah. Right the wings. Can, can you pick those up? Well, you can't see the colors, but you can see it. We can oh. put them against the black background if you'd like. Oh, that's all right. I, th that's the, all of them. Okay. And for Distinguished Flying Service, uh, I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross in March of 1945. 
and what uh, what was special about that mission that you was it well, one mission it, or was it no your? it's it was uh, in my lead capacity there were about three instances that uh, they felt were to be oh I was to be commended for handling the situation the way I did and uh, this was presented to me in March of 45. Would you like to explain anything about those three uh, missions or how do you feel about that? Well I, I, I have the um, citation which would probably explain it better than, than I could. says, for extraordinary achievement while serving as a pilot of a B-17 aircraft on bombing missions over Germany from 1 September 44 to 10 January 1945. Throughout these operations, Lieutenant Balcom demonstrated outstanding ability and exemplary determination. On 8 January 1944, the lead aircraft, which Lieutenant Balcom was piloting, was sustained severe damage from enemy anti-aircraft fire. Evincing superior airmanship, he remained in position and bombs were released upon the assigned target. On 30 October 1944, Lieutenant Balcom assumed the lead position when the lead aircraft was forced to leave formation. Meticul meticulously avoiding the heavily defended areas, he completed, a he completed a successful bomb run and competently guided the formation back to the base. The accurate coolness, the courage, coolness, and skill displayed by Lieutenant Balcom on all these occasions reflect the highest credit upon himself and the armed forces of the United States. He entered the service from Massachusetts, and that's the official citation. Congratulations, That's, those are very impressive. Um, how, did, how did these make you feel when you received these? Well, I guess you uh, kind of stuck your chest out a little, really. Uh, you weren't there, for, you were there to do a job uh, and it was nice to be recognized. But you, you, you did feel a little differently from some of the others. It made you stand out a little, and I guess that was rewarding. Yeah. But I was very glad to get home in one piece. Yeah. So. We were glad that you did so that you could share these with us today. Um, now, you mentioned before the interview last week that you'd gone from private to major. That seems like a very unique achievement for for a soldier during that time. Do you want to explain about that? or? Well, as I said, I went into the Air, Air Force uh, 8th of October 1941 uh, with great expectations of going to aircraft mechanic school, which I did, uh, never thinking too much about becoming an officer or a pilot even until uh, my first duty assignment in, uh, at Hickam Field uh, I was fortunate to be assigned to a section where I had a super first sergeant and a couple of officers who were a little interested in talking to me and uh, in their conversations uh, it came up that uh, I should attempt the uh, aviation cadet exam which I did and passed. I came back to the Western Flying Training Command and uh, started my pilot training. And at the graduation, finishing pilot training, uh, I became an officer and, and I was promoted uh, quite regularly, really, for my 
efforts. Uh, I stayed in the reserve, after I got out of the service, I stayed in the reserve for about 12 years, then became a squadron commander at, uh, in the reserve at Bedford and continued to do some flying in the reserve. Uh, shortly after uh, I left the reserve uh, and asked for my discharge from the reserve section, I was promoted to major and uh, left the service. Congratulations. That's those, those are amazing accomplishments, and uh, we're pleased that you came back with us again today, and we're glad that you could share these medals and commendations with us, and well, we just want to thank you again. I was very glad to come back. Yeah, thank you.